Well, good morning, everybody. Um, I'm going to start by just uh, doing a few um, administrative uh, things, and um, and then I'll turn it over to our uh, to our moderator. Um, let me also just uh, acknowledge the presence uh, at our meeting of uh, Iris Shannon. Uh, Iris is a past is also a past APHA president, um, and she joined us uh, later yesterday morning. I just want to acknowledge her presence here at our at our meeting. Just give her a great round of applause. <laughs> Secondly, I wanted to make sure that everybody understood that that these uh, lanyards um, have a USB drive uh, attached to them. Um, and um, even I can open it up and figure out what it is. Um, but they're, they're there. And but what's important is that they have, uh, this is kind of a semi-paperless meeting. Uh, so we're hoping to um, um, try to keep the, um, the, the number of trees we uh, tragically killed down. And we decided we would try to um, do as much of this uh, electronically as we can. So those USB drives contain a lot of the material, some background material, um, uh, as many PowerPoints as we had um, prior to arrival. Uh, some of them, um, of course, some of the speakers, as you can imagine, did not have uh, time to get their materials to us. Uh, so just to let you know, we will, we will uh, get those that we have collected to you um, uh, two or three weeks after this meeting when we get back and get a chance to, to gather them all together. Um, and so you'll all get those um, in addition electronically. Uh, also, I wanted to point out a couple things on that, on that background paper. Uh, one is a document that was put together by the APHA Public Policy Center uh, which has the uh, Affordable Care Act provisions for prevention and wellness and their current state uh, in terms of implementation. Uh, it's just a, a couple page table that's there that, that I think is a very, very useful tool. And then the next thing is that today we are releasing a fairly comprehensive workforce paper. Um, we looked at the workforce provisions within the, the law and also um, um, it's a great paper. It talks about the context of the public health workforce uh, and what components of that law have not yet been implemented and or funded. And you know, we're obviously planning to take that work forward with all of our public health partners uh, and making a great push to getting the workforce provisions uh, of the Affordable Care Act uh, implemented. We think there's, this is a crucial time to do that uh, many of you may know that in the last uh, few years, we've lost over 44,000 jobs, governmental public health jobs. Phenomenal number. Um, there, there are health departments that, who have been essentially cut in half in terms of their capacity, uh, their staff capacity. So we're going to be actively working uh, to do that. In fact, next week, I'm going to be back here actually in this hotel uh, with the Clinton Global Initiative of America looking at workforce issues. Um, um, chairing a, a subcommittee on public health um, and the public health workforce. So this is something that APHA is very much interested in doing with our public health partners. Um, and then finally, uh, for lunch today, we have box lunches. Um, and um, um, so just get your, get your lunches, and you can eat anywhere. Um, also, I just encourage you to go down. The weather, hopefully a little better today. If you go down to the, the first floor course, you can go out to the... Um, uh, patio there and eat there, but you can eat anywhere as you want. I just encourage you to get back here on time because our lunch speaker um, is a quick in and out. She's flying in, she's going to speak, and then she's got to get out very quickly, uh, which is Kyle Lewis from, the, um, from CMS. Um, with that, I'll, I'll turn that over to our moderator, and um, thank you very much. Great. Thank you. Thank you, Georges, and good morning to everybody. It's great to be here with you. I'm Susan Denser, Editor-in-Chief of Health Affairs. Our topic this morning is Seeking Common Ground, Approaches to Population Health. And of course, we know that for all the attention given our nation's health care crisis, it's arguably the case that we have a major health crisis as well. One in five uh, US adults still smoking, at least 1,000 teenagers probably taking up smoking every day. Uh, two and three U.S. adults overweight or obese. 
Uh, and as uh, we know, we're on our way to potentially 80% of American adults uh, being uh, obese, overweight or obese by 2030. Or as the comedian Stephen Colbert says, at that point, 80% of US adults will be 160% of US adults in terms of total mass. <laughs> Uh, we know that 75% of uh, our dollars uh, expended in healthcare are expended on chronic disease, and we know that much of that chronic illness is indeed preventable. It's diabetes, it's obesity related, it's heart disease, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, we know that life expectancy in much of the country is actually falling, not rising. Some of the recent estimates indicating that particularly in uh, roughly speaking as many as 1,000 counties around the country, life expectancy, especially among women, is falling, not rising. So with all of that, we could really declare that we have a population health crisis, and in fact, the recognition of that was at the heart of many of the provisions, as we know, of the Affordable Care Act. And it certainly is part uh, and parcel of the uh, new focus that the administration is attempting to put on much of the Affordable Care Act, which is the focus of the triple aim that we need to shoot for better health, better health care, and better value for the dollars expended, if not indeed lower cost of health care. I use triple aim even though you may know that uh, the, uh, a lawyer at HHS has declared that if the phrase triple aim is used, it might redound to the benefit of the Institute for Healthcare Improvement, which uh, is attempting to copyright the name, as I understand. So in Washington, it's now referred to as the three-part aim. I would propose that since we are more than outside a 50 mile radius of Washington, we can call it the triple aim. So for today, we will continue to refer to it as the triple aim. Nonetheless, uh, seriously, we know that uh, the provisions of the Affordable Care Act that were put in place to address population health, be it the $15 billion prevention fund, be it the menu calorie labeling provisions, et cetera, et cetera, are all intended to come to grips with this population health crisis and move our system, even our health care system, more to focus on improvements in health. Uh, we know, unfortunately, that that uh, effort has run into two very powerful buzzsaws. One buzzsaw is the buzzsaw over the role of government. Is it appropriate for the national government to tell restaurants, for example, how to frame their menus. Uh, that's one. Uh, is it appropriate for the FDA to regulate tobacco? Uh, another example. Of course, it has also run into the second buzzsaw, which is the fiscal situation. So that is why you are now hearing the $15 billion prevention fund, referred to as the $15 billion prevention slush fund. That is to say, a source of revenues that can be tapped and given back, uh, it is argued, to the American public to use in a far more appropriate way than uh, advancing public health. So this is the world that we are now living in, and this is the focus of our panel today, which is to seek common ground here for approaches to population health that will hopefully steer us clear of these buzzsaws over the role of government and the fiscal situation. Certainly that will take into account the fact that for whatever dollars we expend today on prevention, we can imagine uh, possibly they will produce some savings down the road and avert potentially an even worse fiscal crisis to come uh, when the population is even more unhealthy than it is today. So our panelists today are going to do that and come up, I'm sure, I'm utterly confident with a number of provisions that will be instantly popular on all sides of the aisle and among all ideological factions <laughs> in America that we can then move forward on. They're going to each offer uh, some opening remarks and then we're gonna engage in some discussion among the panel and then broadly with you in the audience. So I'll introduce them uh, all uh, briefly now. First, we're gonna hear from John McDonough who's professor of public health practice at Harvard School of Public Health and director of the new center there for public health leadership. Most recently, he was at Hunter College in New York uh, as uh, the Joan Tisch Distinguished Fellow in Public Health. And of course, as many of you will know, between 2008 and 2010, he was senior advisor on national health reform to the US Senate Committee on Health, Education, Labor, and Pensions, helping to craft uh, the Senate version of the Affordable Care Act. 
Before that, he served as executive director of Healthcare for All, Massachusetts' leading consumer health advocacy organization, which of course helped to enact uh, the Massachusetts health reform. And previous to that, he was an associate professor at the Heller School at Brandeis and a member of the Massachusetts House of Representatives, where he co-chaired uh, the Joint Committee on Health Care. After John speaks, we're going to hear from Oliver Fine, who's professor of clinical medicine and public health and associate dean for affiliations at Weill Cornell Medical College, where he's responsible for Weill Cornell's academic affiliations and the Office of Global Health Education. He's a practicing general internist uh, with a commitment to access to care for vulnerable uh, populations and is the immediate past president of national physicians for a national health program. He's also now chair of the New York Metro chapter of physicians for a national health program and is a past vice president for the U.S. of the American Public Health Association. Uh, he's also on the editorial board of the journal Medical Care. And then we'll hear from Julie Eckstein, who's vice president of the Center for Health Transformation, which was founded by former Speaker of the House, Newt Gingrich. And in this position, she leads the center's state initiatives across the country and also the center's payment reform work group, which uh, has participation both by former Speaker Gingrich and Senator Tom Daschle. She formerly led the Missouri Project, heading up the Missouri Office of the Center for Health Transformation. And in Missouri and around the country, she works with both the legislative and executive branches on state policy initiatives health disparities, obesity and diabetes, and other uh, important areas. Before she joined the center, she served under Governor Matt Blunt as director of the Missouri Department of Health and Senior Services, and then before that as executive director of Healthy Communities of St. Charles County, which focuses on assessing health needs and identifying health gaps in the community and building coalitions across all sectors of the community to address community health needs. So I think you can agree that all of these folks are uniquely positioned to offer comments from their various perspectives about how we can achieve common ground. So join me now in welcoming first to the podium, John McDonough. Thank you, Susan, and good morning, everybody. It's very nice to be here with you with America's public health leadership. And it is a tough time to talk about common ground because there is so much anger and confusion across the nation with our fiscal situation, with political differences. One of the things that I try to do a lot is try to help people understand this system and the way it works and how things happen. And so one of the things that I like to do a lot is just make people think about the controversial process known as lobbying and what that's about. And I don't know how many of you know who was the first lobbyist in human history. Um, but actually, the very first lobbyist was a guy by the name of Moses. <laughs> Moses, on behalf of his clients, the chosen people, <laughs> went up to the mountaintop to negotiate with Yahweh on behalf of the people. He did the best job he could, and he came down from the mountaintop with the tablets, and he gave them the news, and he said, well, folks, I've got good news, and I've got bad news. The good news is, I got him down to 10. <laughs> and the bad news is, adultery is still in there. <laughs> okay. So sometimes that helps. Um, so I'd like to start out, and I do this a lot when I do talking about the Affordable Care Act, I'd like to know uh, two questions from you. First question is I'd like to know how, how well you think you know and understand the Affordable Care Act. So raise your hand, you know, first if you know a huge amount, so much you wish you didn't know so much and you could forget some of it. Second, you sort of know it, but please don't put me up in a crowd of people and try to explain it. Or third, you really don't understand it very well at all. So how many of you think you know a huge amount about this law right now? Okay, medium amount? Okay, and not too much? Okay, this is a pretty good crowd. So, second question. Um, in general, in big general, are you happy it passed and was signed into law? Are you, are, you, are you unhappy or are you still trying to make up your mind? Okay, so how many of you are happy it passed? Okay, how many of you are unhappy it passed? 
Okay, and I assume that's because it didn't go far enough. <laughs> and I mean, you're still trying to make up your mind. <clears throat> okay, this is not my typical crowd, okay? <laughs> <clears throat> so what I would just like to do very briefly in about eight minutes is try to create some context because you know what is in there around prevention and you understand it, but let's kind of step back and look at it from a little bit of a broader health and also political context in terms of understanding the moment we are in right now. So it is a broad sweeping law. It is a landmark law, whether you think it is a landmark great law or a landmark bad law. It is not the best law that could have passed. It is probably the best law that could have gotten through that particular Congress in 2009 and 2010. And everybody, and believe me, everybody in Congress who supported it can instantly think of a hundred ways they could have made it better and it could not have gotten through the process. And that is simply the reality of it. But there is a huge amount there and it is probably the single most important piece of legislation ever passed into law addressing public health and prevention and wellness. And so it is an important moment to understand it. And, and why is it so important? Well, we saw last week with the release of the National Prevention Strategy that for the first time we are seeing the federal government really attempting to be strategic in terms of how to create a national framework to move forward and actually elevate prevention and wellness to the level it should be. And for the first time we can see, and you can see in that document, an attempt on the federal level to elevate and create a health in all policies approach in terms of this. So it is of fundamental importance. We are seeing the backing of a strategy with resources through the Prevention and Public Health Trust Fund and through many, many more investments that are embedded in the statute. We are seeing a historic boost for clinical preventive services, mandating the inclusion of the A and B services with the no cost sharing in all private and most public health insurance policies. We're seeing an affirmation of the role of communities in terms of improving and securing people's health through the community transformation grants and other provisions. We're seeing major significant investments in building a stronger workforce, a public health workforce, and very much a primary care workforce through increases and in investments in the National Health Service Corps and in federally qualified health centers. We're seeing, I believe, the most comprehensive assault on racial and ethnic health inequities, disparities that we have ever seen. There are about 75 provisions in the Affordable Care Act that collectively combine to create the most significant and extensive assault in terms of reducing and eliminating disparities. And let me just put one thing out there. I'm from Massachusetts, so I know a lot about Massachusetts health reform. There's one thing that people don't fully appreciate about Massachusetts health reform. In Massachusetts, five years after the enactment and implementation of the Massachusetts health reform law, racial and ethnic disparities, inequities in health insurance coverage are gone. Prior to health reform, about 78% of non-whites had health insurance and about 88% of whites had health insurance. And according to the latest national data, it is even at 95% of whites and 95% of non-whites. That is not the elimination of racial and ethnic inequities. It is an important, huge step forward and an enabling factor to allow us in Massachusetts to go forward. And that is the promise fundamentally embedded in the Affordable Care Act. So those are just, and then there's, there's a whole lot. And by the way, Susan mentioned the calorie labeling in chain restaurants. What people don't understand, and this blows people's minds a little bit when I tell them this, is by the way, did you know that that provision went into the law with the support of the National Restaurant Association? They supported it going. Now, why did they support it? Because you folks in states and counties and localities were passing your own calorie labeling requirements. They were facing a Tower of Babel 
in terms of people literally defining calories in different ways. And so they went for a national framework and standard that would affect all 50 states rather than having all of this different array of different requirements. So that's how it played out, but it was not viewed as an intrusion by the restaurant industry. They actually welcomed it. So there's a lot in here that's good, and we also just can't have this conversation without talking about what is happening right now with the threats. Because in so many ways, this is the best of times, and also in so many ways, this is the worst of times. Because we are right now potentially in the midst of the largest assault on public health in our nation's history in terms of what is being discussed and considered in Washington, D.C. I think it's fair to say public health is not the principal target. But there is a target and there is a bullseye right in the middle. And public health is right in the middle of that bullseye. You're not there alone. All government, all government, everything government does and very much everything that the federal government does is in that bullseye. We are in an assault on the role of government in society in addressing problems. And we are seeing a sharp, one of the sharpest differences between the parties in terms of their attitudes towards some of the fundamental roles in government. And the consequences and the stakes are very high for the Affordable Care Act and well beyond the Affordable Care Act. I attended the breakout session yesterday on financing of public health and the assaults and the cuts and the important significant eliminations that are being done right now at the state, the county, and the local level are very devastating and very frightening and are going to continue for some time to come. And so it is very important that we be cognizant and understand this moment. How did we get here? We are seeing a fundamental growing partisan difference in terms of the important policy questions that we face as a nation. Uh, just in terms of the Affordable Care Act, just to think about it. So 83% of Democrats say in terms of the ACA that we should expand it or implement it as is. 17% of Republicans feel that way. 12% of Democrats think that we should repeal the Affordable Care Act, and 78% of Republicans feel that way. So that reflects the difference, not just in terms of the Affordable Care Act, but on a host of other things that are so important to this community. The thing to understand fundamentally about the election cycle, the one we went through in 2010 and 28 and so forth, is the issue of, and this is from my, from my colleague at the Harvard School of Public Health, Bob Blendon, it's not about what does the American public think. It's about what do the people who show up to vote think. Because that is fundamentally what counts. In 2008, we had a nearly historic high voter turnout on election day of about 62% of all Americans eligible to vote. In 2010, we had, not historically, but pretty close, to historically low rate of voter turnout of about 42% of folks. And that's the general difference between an off election and a presidential election. But the presidential election was historically high. The turnout in 2010 was historically low. People, friends, all of us have to understand the fate of the Affordable Care Act and the fate of so much of what we are attempting to build and improve and develop through the ACA and through your work will fundamentally significantly be decided on November 6, 2012. If, in fact, Republicans win the House, the Senate, and the White House, it is more than likely that the ACA will be substantially repealed. If Democrats win the White House and the Senate and the House, it is fundamentally likely it will be implemented largely as written and if we have divided government, it's going to be some kind of a jump ball. But the consequences are very severe and very important. And I would like to say we've got wonderful, 
common areas where we can come together and we can solve all these things and we can go into a room. But sometimes, fundamentally, in American politics and public policy, that's not in the cards. And when that's not in the cards, that's when elections matter. And so, as we think about the fate of the Affordable Care Act and so much of what we care about in health and public health, we have to understand the stakes, the consequences, the context in which we're really operating right now. And fundamentally, the future and the fate of so much of what we care about is wrapped up in what's going to happen in November 2012. Thanks. You know, I'm not quite sure where to begin after that. Um, you know, my entire career has been um, at the bedside in the community and, until the last seven years or so where I've been more in government and state government and involved with policy at the national level and state level in my current job. I, I guess I have to say a, a couple things. One, I always thought I was more like you than unlike you um, until the questions that he asked. So it has me um, a little bit um, off, off balance, I guess, would be a good way to put it. Uh, let me ask a question also just in follow-up. So how many of you think you know your communities and the needs of your communities better than the folks in Washington, D.C.? Okay, so we are more uh, alike than maybe some of the other questions uh, might have indicated. And I think common ground is really actually pretty easy for me to talk about, especially when you're talking about health and public health. I think those are the great parts of the bill and the, and the parts of the bill that we should work towards uh, maintaining and improving. Definitely there are other parts of that law that I don't support, uh, that the center doesn't support, and that really need that work that was discussed. So I think common ground in health is an easier place. When I went to be health director, one of my immediate goals was to just get health on the radar screen. We all know for years and years it was never a priority with state administrations or the federal government at, at any point with, with most of our leaders there, that health just wasn't a priority. So beyond what has happened in the outcomes of the law, whether you like it or not, I'm thrilled that health finally is on the radar screen. Although I would say, is it always health or is it health care? And is it health insurance? I don't always believe that it really still is about health. One of the things that attracted me to the center years ago was what we call our four box model. So we have the uh, triple aim and we have the four box model. But the four box model really is about the things that we need to do to get to the goals of 100% insurance coverage and a healthier population. One of our slogans is better health at lower cost. So the first box that we focus on is individuals and individual health. Everything that includes the health disparities and health literacy, the social determinants, empowering people with health education. And along with that be definitely becomes uh, personal responsibility. In addition to that then is the second box, which is about the community, which has been my passion my entire life. And that means how do we ensure that we have the healthiest communities possible for those people who are trying to be healthy? You know that if, if you're in a community, whether that's your worksite community, your school community, your geographic community in a city, a county, a state, et cetera, and you're not supported in your efforts to be healthy, you're gonna have a difficult time. So our goal in that second box is to build healthy communities so that they can support individuals in their attempts to be healthy. So that's about building the environments, having the policies that support that. The third box is where we get into the effective and efficient delivery of care. And we know all of the changes that need to happen there also to make sure that people get evidence-based medicine, to make sure that the care that they should get is received more often than about the 50% of the time that we know it is today. So there are a lot of things that go into that third box around health information technology that is another of those bipartisan issues. Both sides agree. We need better technology in healthcare, in healthcare delivery and in, in health education, all of those things. It's not until that fourth box that we talk about the financing of healthcare. And unfortunately, that's usually where most conversations over the years have started in talking about any kind of reforms. So it's always important to say, I don't know anyone who's against health reform. We have a health crisis and we have a health care crisis. Both of those demand reforms in our industries and in our lack of system. And so when I hear people say that there are those that are against health reform, I don't think that's accurate. 
I think the difference is in what models, what forms of health reform do we support and which ones should move forward. So what I would suggest as really one of the most important common ground platforms is we need to ensure and start creating a culture of health in our communities and in our nation. We are the farthest thing from a culture of health uh, as possible. And along with that goes some of the differences in incentives versus mandates, et cetera. And, and you know, it's, it's difficult sometimes to be talking about mandates. If any of you followed the center, we really have talked over the years about how do we get to 100% insurance coverage? How do we ensure that especially those who have enough money to pay for their health insurance, how do we ensure they do that? It's a very difficult dilemma because it's not fair. It's a health justice issue, it's a financial justice issue to ensure that people throughout our nation are responsible for their health care when they can be. We definitely believe firmly in a strong safety net. We have to have that. So that's why it's important, I think, to understand that there are some differences there. But I want to do something a little different with my time and share a vision for what I think is what's necessary to get us to population health. That was really what this was about, seeking common ground in population health. So my vision really is at that community level. It, it definitely includes all of you working on the ground, which is where I've spent my career. And I say that is the hardest work, the hardest job I've ever had. When I led a coalition, and I, I see a couple friendly faces out there from the St. Louis area who are trying to attempt some coalition work now across the whole St. Louis metro area, which is even more difficult than just one county or one municipality. When you're trying to build coalitions with the turf issues, with sustainability issues, with leadership issues, that is the hardest work I've ever done. There's nothing easy about that. It's much easier to run a state health department, much easier to be in the job I am now than that very important work. So I applaud all of you who are working at the very local level to continue that work because that's where the rubber hits the road, whether it's in the clinical bedside work or if it's in your local community around public health. But my vision would be, first of all, that there is 100% insurance coverage and that this model would be a systemic model in the community, that insurance is one piece of it, I would suggest one of those association plan models, if you live or work in that community, you would qualify for insurance. And that you can work with the insurance companies to identify what are their models, really, for fiscal sustainability and for profit and all those things that are needed to give jobs to people. I did some of that work in talking with some of them in our St. Louis area and was astounded at what they would be willing to do if they were working in a coalition environment was something just, for example, saying if I cover 50 people who are paying for their insurance, I'd be willing to cover another five who aren't able to pay for that. So there are all kinds of very interesting models, I think, at the, at the local level. I'm very supportive of what Massachusetts did for Massachusetts. I believe that it has to be very different based on your community. What Massachusetts did isn't going to be okay for Missouri. What Massachusetts did isn't going to be uh, okay for some of our other neighbors or other states. And so I think that one of the opportunities is around giving allotments of either, even the federal fundings like Medicaid, sometimes it's called block granting, to states that they can even pass down to local communities to decide how they want to use it. I believe in my community, because we have systems built and would like to build even more systems, that we know how to spend that better money better than even the state level, and that's sometimes difficult to say as a state health officer. Um, but definitely the, the locals know how to use that money. And one of the things that I think is the most lacking is the system approach to all of this. Everything is done in silos. Even thinking about all the issues that we're addressing these days, whether we're talking about what's in the law or health reform on, on the big picture. How do ACOs relate to HIT and the health information exchanges, to the health in, uh, insurance exchanges, to public health, to health disparities, to obesity, all of those things. There's really not a good mind map about how do they all interact. And I think that's the one thing that if we could all come together on common ground to really identify that and how to most effectively and efficiently create systems, that would be important. I think one of the other most important issues is the one that Susan said that I've worked to lead at the center about payment reform. If we don't realign the incentives in our delivery systems, we will never get the health outcomes that we want. I think the, the bill went a little way in doing that. I think if it went even further, I, I would be overjoyed. Uh, the payment reform needs to be number one, key lever 
in changing the system, again, to get to the health outcomes we want, to get to value in the system that we can afford rather than the volume that we get over and over again. So back to the vision a little bit more. So if you're at that community level and you have models that fit the community about 100% insurance, and you have systems where you can utilize the government funding, the Medicaid funding, not only for those that Medicaid was really meant for initially, the moms, kids, et cetera, but you know, it's grown, I'm sure you know, over time to be more about long-term care. The seniors and disabled take up 75, 80% of those funds in most of the states. So if we don't really start getting a handle on that piece of it, then it won't be there for the rest of the system who, who really needs that net. I, I think that vision of the local community model of population health definitely includes getting all of those players together. Everybody that was involved in the coalition that I ran, as well as those that you're involved in, and I know those who are looking at the community uh, grants these days that you have to create the coalition if you haven't already. But getting public health, getting the hospitals, getting insurance companies, getting law enforcement, getting the faith community, the parents, everybody around the table, to really do that assessment work and identify priorities for how are we going, going to address those gaps, those needs in our community around health. So health education, you know, it's really interesting. Most of the time, having worked in hospitals and health education for a long time, it was more about marketing than really about best practices in health education and really making the outcomes a reality for folks. So I think if we do all of the pieces that I think everybody in this room agree we need in a local community, do that at the community level, we can definitely get to population health like never before. And I think take public health to a new level in having people even understand what public health is about. So I know that my time is up, so we'll uh, have more discussion later. Well, good morning. Oh, come on. Good morning. Good morning. <laughs> ah, thank you. Yesterday, uh, as I understand it, Jennifer Granholm challenged us as public health workers to focus and get radical. Uh, I'm going to focus this morning on one way that I think we can take up her admonition. We can become advocates for a vision that goes beyond the Affordable Care Act, namely a single-payer national health reform. <laughs> My approach to improving population health is grounded in single-payer national health reform. Now, I am well aware it, you know, that uh, all of the uh, social determinants of health, of all of them, uh, medical care is actually probably the least important. Socioeconomic factors like income inequality, poor housing, lack of educational opportunity have a much more profound effect on population health. But the health system remains the critical link, I think, in the public's eye to improved population health. We in public health must address health system reform and keep the vision, frankly, of single payer alive. So then I think the quite critical question is, what is single payer reform? Uh, how could you explain it to someone on the shopping cart line, for instance? And I'd like to suggest there are four major principles. First, universal access to care. And what I think that should translate into is automatic enrollment. You present to the emergency room of a hospital they do their wallet biopsy on you, right? <laughs> Find out you have no health insurance. Well, what a wonderful opportunity. Let's sign you up right here for the National Health Insurance Program. Is there any private health insurance company in this country that would sign you up when you arrived in an emergency room? No way. 
Uh, and the other big question, and I agree, a major political one, is who gets that automatic enrollment? I would argue it should be for all residents of the United States. Uh, and that issue, of course, is one that's very divisive within the country right now, but one that I think we should look for, frankly, in all legislation that deals with health insurance. The second principle that is that we should have free choice. Free choice not of a health plan, frankly, but free choice of a doctor or a nurse practitioner uh, or hospital. Uh, and frankly, there should be no financial barriers to health care. Get rid of these deductibles. Get rid of these co-payments. They are the most crude way of trying to control the demand for health services. Because what they do is they retard or eliminate, frankly, needed care as much as they do needless care. There should be first dollar coverage, in essence, for health care. The third principle is that there should be coverage for a comprehensive set of benefits, not just a basic benefit package. That means, frankly, coverage for everything from preventive services to physician, nurse practitioner, dental, mental health, medication, reproductive health, and long-term care. All medically necessary services. Oh my, you say, well, would there be any exclusions? Well, sure. I think I would exclude tummy tucks or Botox for wrinkles, right? Well, and maybe even private rooms in a hospital, okay? You know, I'm in a room with John. He's coughing away. The resident comes in and says, I think you might have tuberculosis. Oh, get me out of his room. He has a medically necessary reason for a private room. So comprehensive benefits is the third principle. And fourth, all of this should be, frankly, through public funding, not through premiums, OK? Why? Because premiums are, frankly, ultimately very unfair. The president of the company pays the same premium as the secretary in the company, and yet their incomes are so widely different. Yes, this means public funding means that we have to do that through taxes, and I would argue some combination, frankly, of payroll taxes, income and corporate taxes, even taxes on unearned income. Well, these four principles, universal access with automatic enrollment, free choice, no payment at the point of service, coverage that's comprehensive and public funding. Is this affordable? Well, yes, I would argue, frankly, it is. Because of the enormous administrative savings that occur when you move from a multi-payer for-profit insurance system to a single-payer system. It is estimated that anywhere from 16 to 30 percent of our health care dollars are spent on these administrative costs, not just in the insurance industry, but frankly in my clinical practice office where I have to hire additional people to actually provide, uh, you know, my uh, care in terms of dealing with the 25 different private insurance companies that I face. And for instance, also within hospitals, we did a study comparing Toronto General with the Mass General, three billers at Toronto General, 300 billers at the Mass General. So if we went from this multi-payer system, and that's, by the way, 
how this differs from just introducing a public option. Because under a public option, we would have, frankly, all of those multi-payers still and not be able to achieve those administrative services. We could move from this multi-payer system to a single-payer system if we could do that. I think we would have the dollars to provide, again, first dollar coverage to everybody in the United States without increasing the overall cost to the system. So single payer provides us with the platform to address population health. Without single payer, the public health system is constantly trying to catch up, trying to plug the holes left in the healthcare system. It is difficult to get upstream and to improve population health. I recently came across a quote from Martin Luther King which captured, I think, the essence of what I am about. He said, quote, on some positions, cowardice asks the question, is it safe? Expediency asks the question, is it politic? Vanity asks the question, is it popular? But conscience asks the question, is it right? And there comes a time when we must take a position that is neither safe, nor politic, nor popular, but must take it because conscience tells us it is right. For single-payer improved Medicare for all, that time is now. Thank you very much. Okay, well, thanks all three of you for a terrific set of uh, opening remarks. Uh, since the title of this panel is Common Ground, uh, I'm going to focus on those points. I think the fault lines here are pretty clear uh, <laughs> on, uh, say, the Affordable Care Act. But so, like Sisyphus rolling the stone up the hill, I'm going to try again and again to roll the Common Ground stone up the hill here for a few minutes to try to forge some agreement. And frankly, I did hear some points of agreement, notwithstanding the points of difference. First of all, all three of these folks said uh, public health and population health is critical. There's a clear agreement across the board on that. John said uh, we essentially have in the Affordable Care Act uh, the best of times in that respect. Uh, could be the worst of times, he said, with the assault on all of this, but it's the best of times. Julie said the great parts of the bill are focused on public health. And she said, I'm thrilled health is on the national radar screen. And you heard that the first box of the four box model at the Center for Health Transformation is better health at lower cost, focusing on social determinants on the community, et cetera. And Oliver said uh, in his uh, proposed single payer system, uh, preventive services have to be at the top of the list. And he went on to say, of course, we know medical care is not the primary determinant of health status. Social determinants are. So there's general agreement that population health and public health is, is critically important. Uh, prevention, critical, again, all, across all three. In Oliver's model, preventive services are covered. Julie talked a lot about the importance of prevention. And of course, you heard about the provisions of the Affordable Care Act. Uh, no co-payments for many preventive services in Medicare now, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Very important uh, uh, fundamental principles of the bill uh, reflecting that as well. And I would hazard to say that at least for two, two out of three of these comments, we heard that the role of communities is crucial. Uh, John didn't necessarily say this in so many words, but so much of the Affordable Care Act are dollars that are, yes, raised at the federal level, but they're shoved out to communities. Uh, the communities are told to what, what, in effect, to spend them on, but the community health transformation grants, all of those are aimed at having communities take the dollars and put them to use as they see fit. Uh, other provisions of the law, the community health assessment needs that hospitals will be required to undertake are for them to focus on the health needs of their communities and to map a plan for meeting them. 
So I think you've got a common thread there that notwithstanding possibly a debate over raising the revenue at the federal level, uh, level there's a clear acknowledgement that communities, this is the work fundamentally of communities. This is the work of entities close to individual communities and populations. So that seems to me a very powerful set of principles to build on. I guess I would say that there's cl pretty clear agreement on a lot of the ends here, maybe a little bit of disagreement on the means. So let's talk a bit more about that and how we could potentially forge some common ground. Julie, I want to ask you the first question because it does seem to a lot of people, a lot of observers, that there's a very fundamental understanding about many aspects of the Affordable Care Act, like what we were, uh, I was just talking about, this notion that communities really are intimately evolved, especially on the population health pieces. How, for just for starters, if there are more, assuming there are more people like you that think that public health really is important and communities need to have a role in it, how do we begin to educate people just about what's actually in the law on those things and potentially alleviate some concerns about federal takeover of public health because that's not inherent in the, in the law. I think one of the most interesting things I have viewed for a long, long time is that's not newsworthy. The common ground isn't newsworthy. So getting the word out, educating people is very, very difficult, especially when you don't have the media kind of embracing the facts, the fact that there is a lot of common ground. Um, I mentioned to somebody, I was at the reception yesterday evening and mentioned even um, former Speaker Gingrich's work across the aisle on health issues for a long, long time with a variety of people. And I think people are surprised to hear that because it's never covered. People don't want to hear where there's agreement. It's only where there are differences. So I, I'm not sure I have the answer of how you educate people about the good parts of the bill, especially around pre uh, prevention and public health, the community transformation grants, all of that because it's not newsworthy. That, that's not what they wanna hear 24 seven on every station that we have. I think it really is the, the continued challenge of the public health community around just what is public health. Um, you know, my philosophy on, on that as, as a messaging piece is kind of like an umpire at a baseball game. I'm a huge Cardinal baseball fan um, and baseball in general. Uh, uh -oh, oh, good, we have a few really either Cardinal fans or baseball <laughs> fans. Good, another area of common ground. Um, but I'm in Cub territory, so that's always challenging. Um, but an umpire is like public health because they're there doing their job and you never know their name until something bad happens. So you're protecting everyone's health, you're doing all the research, you're doing all the good work, and it's only when there's a disaster, quite frankly, whether it's a Hurricane Katrina or earthquakes or Joplin uh, tornadoes or any of those kind of things that people start to hear a little bit about public health and they hear more about it when something has gone wrong and they wanna blame someone. So I think it's just a challenge period in people understanding not only public health but prevention, wellness, all of it when it's not newsworthy. John? Well, I think uh, we heard some really interesting analysis yesterday from Celinda Lake in terms of polling that shows that there's actually a growing appreciation on the part of the American public for prevention and even for wellness. And, and I'd like to say, you know, by the way, um, I think that the Center for Health Transformation, I've worked with folks there, I think they do really terrific work. And uh, so my comments weren't aimed at you. In fact, if, if I were, I, I would nominate you to be the chair of the House Energy and Commerce <laughs> Committee because I think we'd be doing a lot better if, uh, if, if you were there. But I think, I think part of what we have to recognize is that, um, is that th there was already one direct attempt that passed the House to repeal the Prevention and Public Health Fund. Uh, the Community Transformation Grants are referred to as slush funds for jungle gyms and walking paths and things like that. There was uh, a, a legislation passed in the House in January to repeal the entire Affordable Care Act uh, without exception, not leaving Title IV and Title V workforce and prevention in place. Uh, the Ryan budget um, repeals the entire Affordable Care Act with the exception of the $450 billion in cuts to Medicare that the Republicans used to beat up the Democrats to take control of the House last year. 
So, um, so I, getting so the common ground. There's John. common ground. <laughs> it's, it, it is. It is. It is real. I mean, I, you just got to be real. It is but hard to find. There's, yeah. there's process issues there's versus policy issues. We could, issues. We could oh, yeah, work we it could, out. We could work it out. Us, but, it's, but we're not it's the politicians. In, yeah. And that right. challenge is always out in front and and on the camera and those kind of things. And I, I guess what frustrates me the most about that process, and I would say our organization also supports the repeal, but goes to replace and recycle. And it's not because we don't think there are great parts of the bill, but it's the process. It is very, very difficult to take a, a, a law of that size and try to keep section 1, 2, 20, 36, and 52 without having impact on all of the other sections. So let's just push back on that if I can. No, I mean you could they could have first of all they in January they said they they repealed the law right. and they said they were going to replace it. And then in late May Dave Camp, the House Ways and Means Chair said, "Well, sorry, we're not going to put anything out to try to replace it at all." Because but it's not going have, anywhere on the Senate but, side. But they could have but they could have repealed it and they could have left Title 4 Prevention and Wellness and Title 5 Workforce in place, just to give two examples on which there's a lot of common ground and a lot of agreement, but they didn't. It was the whole thing because there's not that appreciation in a search for common ground. The, the Republicans are playing to their base and the Democrats are playing sure. to their base and oh, that's okay. where we are. So here comes Sisyphus again. <laughs> <laughs> Let's, rather than have a seminar on how to pass or repeal legislation in the US Congress, <laughs> Let's focus on back to the, this question. We know that it is going to take some dollars now to be expended on advancing health. Uh, would that it were not so, but it's going to. It's going to cost some money. It's going to require investments in the public health workforce to build that up. It's possibly going to be re require the creation of new community health worker teams to bring health issues closer to the public. Julie, what do you think is the prospect in this fiscal climate to even uh, have people broadly understand just what you said, the role of public health workers, the role of the public health community, and the benefits to us all from keeping that enterprise intact and, and building it? I think there, we could discuss it at the federal level yeah. or the state level or yeah. both. I want to say that at the state level, because I spent time intimately there, the big challenge to public health in my department was Medicaid. Medicaid is the thousand pound gorilla that is swallowing up all of the public health dollars. And so if you care about all of those things, if you care about the strong safety net and have 100% coverage and all those things, but also care about public health and also care about education and your roads and economic development and jobs and all of those other things, we have to figure out some solutions to the economic side of it, is how do we pay for those things? We don't have enough money in our budgets right now to fund the expansion of Medicaid as much as we might want to do that. And every time we do expand it, I tell you, the money comes from public health. That's why there are the reductions. So it's not a matter of just going out and beating the drum and being a cheerleader and we need more money for public health. It's we need to be a part of the solution for the entire, the entire problem rather than just us, again, as one silo in, in the big system. Well, let me bring you into this conversation, Oliver, because m many of your comments were addressed at single payer and the health care system broadly. And, but as you right. said, we really have to make uh, inroads into some of the social determinants, the underlying factors to health. What about this tension uh, of Medicaid and even Medicare swallowing up so many of these dollars on health care that not enough is being done on the public health side. Well, I, I think that may well be very true in the context of states, largely because, again, Medicare is a program uh, that requires state participation, essentially, in the funding of it. Um, if we talk in terms of a, again, more of a single-payer approach, uh, it seems to me we would be relieving states of a lot of that burden. Uh, we would also be able to take state workers who presently have to be insured uh, through state tax funds uh, and actually probably decrease the amount that the state has to put into uh, health insurance because a single payer will frankly reduce 
the overall costs of health insurance in this country. So I think that, again, that vision is important to continue to have uh, with respect to, you know, even the Medicaid program. So are you suggesting that Medicaid programs are run more effectively and efficiently than commercial insurance products? Uh, that Medicaid programs or Medicare? Or both. I would argue that, that Medicare in Government programs. Well, uh, I would say that Medicare offers, number one, uh, patients the greatest choice of physician and hospital today in this country. You're not limited to a network of providers, which almost all private insurance limit you to because they negotiate contracts with the individual hospitals and doctors. And number two, in terms of the financing of it, Medicare is not perfect. The deductibles have gone up. There is a copayment process in the Medicare program. Those things I would see improving and uh, actually uh, you know, removing from the Medicare program. But as a program, um, we find the greatest satisfaction, frankly. You look at the Commonwealth studies that have compared private insurance with Medicare. People are more satisfied on the Medicare program than they are with private health insurance. So I think all of those things lead to the notion that a, a, an improved Medicare for all really is a direction that we should be talking about. One of the uh, areas, John mentioned a number of areas that House Republicans in particular have had difficulty with. We should stipulate that Senate Republicans are not of, the, of a mind with House Republicans on a lot of the issues you, you identified. None, nonetheless, there is also now an effort to defund the Food and Drug Administration in part to get at its ability now to regulate tobacco, among other things. Julie, help us understand where the role of regulation uh, comes in uh, in terms of measures that particularly are aimed at, at, a, at a positive published public health outcome, for example, prevention of smoking or elimination of smoking? Well, I think government definitely has a role in, in being an enabler, but not always the architect of everything. I think uh, many of the regulations are too prescriptive. Um, take the ACO um, regulations that haven't been popular, even amongst those organizations that have been the leaders in integrated care. I think the, the thought was very good, and, and the principles behind even the ACO are very good, but what typically happens in the regulation process, and I've been involved in those too, is that at times they try to um, compensate for every potential loophole, because we know in healthcare it has become a horrible game of how to game the system if you're a hospital and get more dollars and reimbursement there. If you're on the Medicaid side, how to do it, Medicare side, no matter what, it's all a game. And they can create a whole other department to try to figure out how to get through and create some loophole. So the regulations are often tried to, trying to be so tight to avoid loopholes. Well, then it becomes more problematic and even those who want to engage in it can't do it. You brought up the FDA. I think the FDA modernization work is critical in getting the right care to people as, as, pharma, as far as the pharmaceutical world, um, trying to reduce regulation so that the cost of the research and development into pharmaceuticals can go down over time, especially if you're talking about special populations that we have to work with and the orphan drugs and ultra-orphan drug issues, that that is a very challenging piece. We could get into a whole hour discussion around that. But I think it's over-regulation that has caused a lot of problems and it's, there really has to be a balance. We have to have parameters for people to work in and try not to game the system and, and be appropriate. Uh, I think the preventive pieces, uh, best practices, I think are the way to go in a lot of that. I'm very much a fan of raising tobacco taxes. Missouri is one of the lowest, uh, maybe the lowest in, in tobacco taxes. It's evidence-based approach to uh, prevent teens from starting smoking. It's not gonna impact the adults, but if we can do that more and more, it's um, gonna be effective. You even mentioned the restaurant um, issue. The same thing in Missouri that I experienced with tobacco, that the municipalities were going uh, municipality by municipality to do smoking bans, et cetera, and there the tobacco industry told me that they would support a statewide uh, ban but didn't want to do it in communities. And you know that was surprising to a lot of people similar to the restaurant industry. So you know I, I think there has to be a, a very 
tightly walked line around regulation balance. I just want to say on the uh, menu calorie labeling provision of Affordable Care Act, John is totally right. There was in, uh, restaurant industry support for that because to avoid uh, lots of different state laws. There was disagreement though, as I understand, on one thing, which is that whether the chef's special on the menu had to have its calorie disclosed. <laughs> and in fact, it turned out in the final law, the chef's special does not have to have <laughs> calories disclosed. So you know now, you're forewarned, do not order the chef's special <laughs> when you go into a chain well, restaurant because well, you're guaranteed it's a $3,000 or 3,000 calorie uh, well, and, there was, and there was one. There was one other controversy, which was whether or not movie theaters had to disclose the calories of and the bathtub-sized popcorn, popcorn boxes <laughs> and stuff. And the FDA decided not to require that, which I think is unfortunate. Right. So two things you must not eat uh, going forward. Okay. Well, I think I heard uh, two pieces of common ground, and I'm going to take what I got. Uh, one is that there are some good provisions of the Affordable Care Act which we need to broadly educate people about, especially about the role that communities are going to play. Uh, and there's an agreement that, that the money has to be spent. There's no way around it. We need this $15 billion, whether it, and it's not a slush fund, I heard. It's really important dollars. I also heard that there's wide agreement on when, when you've got evidence and evidence bases of something that works to improve health, you should do it, even if it involves, dare we say the word, a tax, tobacco taxes, for example, uh, et cetera. So that's, I think I heard that as well as some of the things I mentioned earlier about agreement around the importance of prevention, blah, blah, blah. So with that, let's open it up to questions and comments from those of you in the audience. There are mics in the center aisle, as you know. You do have a question or a comment or a uh, speech masquerading as a question, uh, <laughs> please come to the center aisle <laughs> and introduce yourself by name and affiliation if you would. Uh, good, and Susan. let's start, I think we heard the, I saw the first person line up in the back, so let's start at the back there and then we'll come to the front. Thank you so much. Uh, Pam Duffy from Iowa. Uh, it seems to me that the uh, workforce right now in the insurance industry is so significant and a driver of the economy in terms of employment, I'd like each of the panelists to talk about either how that workforce would be redeployed under reform or under a single payer system, Oliver, and how you address that in terms of creating change since health insurance lobbies are such a significant special interest group. Thank you. Well, I'm, I'm not sure that's the expertise of this panel, but Julie, you want to Take a stab I Oliver probably needs to, but I'll just comment that I, <clears throat> I think that's a, a real concern if you're pragmatic about making some, a change like that, similar to making changes in the tax code, um, that we have so many tax accountants and uh, in, uh, an entire industry around um, the IRS and our taxes that I just don't think it's um, practical that we will ever make that change politically <laughs> um, in that policy because of it. it. It's a huge jobs issue, definitely. Yeah, let, let me say <clears throat> that we're very aware of that issue and uh, therefore, for instance, H.R. 676, which is one of the single payer bills that has uh, close to 80 co-sponsors in the House, has a jobs retraining component built into it. Um, we have been trying to assess much more carefully what is the size of the workforce in the health insurance industry uh, and uh, hope that for instance, if there are any PhD students in the audience, that someone might actually take on this task. It's a kind of interesting one. It was one, for instance, that was raised at the point at which we talked about uh, converting uh, our nuclear industry from building bombs, for instance, uh, to uh, other forces of peaceful use. Uh, that was also a very real focus. How do we make those changes? And I'm not saying that we know exactly at this point, but I think, in fact, we have uh, real opportunities to do that. I can say, for instance, in my own office, what I would try to do is take those people who are presently dealing with the insurance companies and actually have them begin to do community outreach, right? Have them follow up the patient who misses an appointment. Have them make home visits things that are meaningful, again, in terms of truly changing 
uh, the health practices of my patients. Would you so there are that? many, many ways to do this. Okay, great. Let's take a question in the front here. Um, <clears throat> my name is Neha Rosvi. I'm a practicing physician and I also do medical reviews. Um, I know that there is a lot that we do um, in medicine which I don't think really necessarily adds value. How, uh, you all have different perspectives and you've touched on regulation, the single payer and policies. How in your, um, I guess, ideology or system, systems, will you be looking at cost effectiveness and things that really add value? Because I think that's really important in also being able to find that money to, because there's a lot of things that we do that don't need to be done, and we could then use that money to do the things that we need to do and to provide insurance for those who don't have it. John, let's talk about that in the context of the Affordable Care Act and the triple aim focus. Better health, better care, less cost. Uh, and the implicit thing there is better value for the dollars expended on care. So the, the, the intellectual presumption at the start of the process in 2008 into 2009 was that the healthcare delivery system was loaded with enormous waste and inefficiency valued at as much as a third of healthcare spending. And that if we could figure out how to get at that waste and inefficiency, that could be the key to actually paying for universal coverage and improving the system. And that consensus along the path to enactment and since enactment has eroded. And so instead, alternatively now from Paul Ryan's vision, we move away from that and we say it is going to be moving toward creating financial accountability on Medicare enrollees. But there is embedded in the Affordable Care Act a host of interventions that are attempting to get precisely at that. One of them that we haven't mentioned is comparative effectiveness research. In Title VI of the law, there is established a patient-centered outcomes research institute, which is now a new national enterprise that will be trying to do that. In addition to all the other things that are going on, it will not look at cost. It will look at clinical comparative effectiveness, but people can take it beyond there. That's one example. Accountable care organizations, for, with all their flaws, medical homes, value-based insurance design, so many interventions, uh, reducing hospital infections, uh, preventing, uh, eliminating preventable readmissions as much as possible. All of those things are attempts to get at it. Some of them are going to work. Some of them are going to flop on their face. But in, in science, you know you have many, many more failures before you get to the success. And what we need as a nation is a determination to get at that success. And, and one of the real disappointments in the in, in, the, in the political morass of what's happened to health reform has been the loss of that vision that we can, in fact, and we know from international comparisons, create a much better, more effective, sounder system. Um, and we seem to have lost that vision, unfortunately, particularly in the translation to the American public. Just, w just one example. Just look at the New York Times last week. It was a federal report on the number of hospitals around the country that are giving consumers double CT scans on the same day that is not only not clinically effective, it is harmful in terms of the ionizing radiation you're giving those folks. That's the kind of stuff that the Affordable Care Act has in its sights to get rid of, but mm -hmm. it runs into then, oh, you can't influence the sacred doctor-patient relationship. How sacred is that relationship when a hospital's giving you two chest CT scans on the same day? Not too sacred to me. It's sure. really all about payment reform. Your question goes to the heart of the work we've done for the last year in a very bipartisan way. <clears throat> so I encourage you to go look at the paper if you want the long view, um, because there are really six strategies that we feel need to be addressed to get to that value instead of that value proposition. Um, he mentioned several of them. The fraud piece of it, you know, that's obviously a, a huge part of it and responsibility from all players in the system. What was interesting about the work, I think, were two things. One, we had representation from about 40 organizations around the entire healthcare industry, pharmaceuticals, insurance companies, health systems, uh, and beyond, uh, health IT, et cetera. 
And we came to this table saying, everybody's gonna have to give up something because each of you have a role to play and part of the blame in this game. So when we came to the, the end result paper of the recommendations for how to get to that new aligned uh, incentive system, there were only a few organizations that didn't want to put their name on the paper and it was all because of politics. They were afraid somebody in on the Hill would read the paper and oh my gosh, what's that gonna do to our lobbying uh, efforts and blah, blah, blah. So that was one learning. The other learning was that <clears throat> out of the set of recommendations, and recall Senator Daschle was a partner in doing this and I thoroughly enjoyed um, getting to know him and working with him, a great guy. Um, there was only one he could he, that he disagreed about and it was the role of government. Was government the enabler or the architect? He believes it's more the architect, much more involved than I believe. So anyway, it's a, I think a, a exhaustive paper on that very issue, healthtransformation.net. I love, and let me just say for a moment that I do think payment reform is important in this matrix. The difficulty is that I think one of those tools, for instance, ACAs, is unfortunately going to be much too weak. A to ACOs, A accountable ACOs, care ACOs, I'm sorry, uh, are likely to be much too weak in actually accomplishing this. You know, again, if we went more toward a global budgeting system for hospitals, I think we might have a real tool that would both control costs and be able to emphasize quality. All right, well thank you. We've got a number of questions to get through, so we're gonna try to do that as expeditiously as possible. Let's go to the back. Good, good morning and thanks for this. I have a, I'm a physician from Los Angeles. My name is Rishi Manchanda. I have a question actually um, in the spirit of finding common ground about the means as opposed to the ends. Clearly there's a lot of dialogue and debate necessary about the ends, but a question about process and means. Um, in 2008, the Veterans Administration reversed a policy uh, barring voter registration, for instance, in VA hospitals, and that was in response to a lot of pushback from the right and the left. The question is really about, regardless of the engine that, we're, that each of you are working on and supporting, whether it's uh, getting more community engagement at the local level, to Ms. Eckstein's point, or um, getting more voter engagement for 2012 to Dr. McDonough's, or supporting uh, the political expediency of single payer, Regardless of that engine, the fuel that's required is civic engagement. The specific question, first to Ms. Eckstein and then to the other panelists is, would you collectively endorse uh, the ability of Americans to register to vote, just like the v veterans are now allowed to do, in our public institutions, um, in public hospitals and other institutions represented over here? Would you support the ability of more voices to be at the table so that their options are not on the menu? Okay, well, let's maybe just a quick poll. Yes, yes, no. Yes. Let's see. <coughs> Excuse me, yes. 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 Okay, Definitely. there you have it. There you have it. Common ground. Eureka. Eureka. Okay, let's go to the front here. Hi. Uh, so I guess this is a, a suggestion that's bordering on a speech. Um, <laughs> and, and I guess framed as a question, of course. Um, I'm a Stuart Berman at CDC, and I guess I, 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 it seems to me there's a lot of common ground agreement on a lot of the facts about what's going on with the healthcare system, a lot more disagreement on the solutions. Well, I, I would suggest that the public, given that come the next election, is going to be hit with a lot of talk, you know, a lot of demagoguery. What's the potential for generating maybe 10 important 20 facts that the country should know? You know, and I think Health Affairs, Kaiser Family Foundation, and, and, and the Center for Health Transformation could bless these as the facts. The issue about how often care is provided that uh, doesn't help you or doesn't, and, and, and may even hurt you. People don't know that. People think ours is the best system in the world. It is not. So the issues of quality, the issues of coverage, the issues of where the money goes, agreeing on the facts so that you have a document out there and all reporters can be re per, you know, referencing that one list over and over again. The same website, the same agreed upon facts that you all bless, so you, at least you have in, uh, individuals have a chance to hear it over and over again, refer to it over and over again, so over the course of the year you have a chance to have an honest discussion. It does not exist at this point. It's an interesting uh, point, a play on Daniel Patrick Moynihan's famous phrase that everybody's exactly. entitled to his or her exactly. own opinion, but not uh, his or her own oh, facts. Okay. Well, <laughs> it, 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 I'll just say personally, it's a frustration of ours at Health Affairs because things we think everybody knows, it turns out everybody doesn't know. John mentioned comparative effectiveness research. The Institute of Medicine report on that said 
for more than half of the treatments that we offer in the country, we lack direct evidence that it works. Now, we think everybody knows this, right? But everybody doesn't right. know that. What, what do you think? Is there, you know, could we conceive of sort of a Magna Carta of, you know, we all agree on the following propositions. Uh, we the people. Uh, well, I'm a postmodern kind of guy. And so <laughs> I, um, I, I think while we could agree these are facts, I don't think what we could agree on is what are the most important facts. But if I would nominate one fact to put out there, it is the fact of that US chart of life expectancy in the large parts of the country where the first time we see life expectancy, and it's in that middle and south, it's Arkansas, it's Missouri, where life expectancy in counties is dropping. Not my county, by the way. Not your <laughs> county. <laughs> but Missouri's in, 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 in the target, but Mississippi and Georgia. Life expectancy dropping in the United States in a national conversation. What the hell is going right. on? Because of tobacco use, because of obesity, diet. because of diabetes, because of mm -hmm. diet, et cetera, et cetera. Mm -hmm. What do you think, Julie? Is there hope for uh, getting those, these facts out and agreed upon? Well, again, I think the facts we do agree on, but it's the solutions that are the most important piece of it, and there won't be agreement on that in any Magna Carta. So, you know, if we wanted to try to do the facts, we could, but then what? Mm -hmm. Well, get, get the facts out, though. I agree with the uh, questioner that uh, there is a real problem in that the, the public doesn't know the facts about the American healthcare system. And we do, uh, it seems to me, have an obligation to try to get those out there. I'm not sure how to do that. I do a lot of speeches about the problem, setting up we have a health crisis, we have a health care crisis. And it's often even to people in the health care field that don't know it. So uh, what do you suggest? You're in the media. Well, we just, we, you know, we try to keep publishing variations on the theme in the hope that we'll, we'll finally break through. And I will say, it's gratifying for us at Healthcare, it's just to brag on ourselves for a moment, uh, it is very clear that our, our page views and other things are going up so enormously that we know that there's growing interest in these problems, and thank goodness there are. Again, maybe there's uh, hope for agreeing on some solutions. Okay, so let's see, I think we go back to the back for the next question. Good morning, uh, Dot Neri from the University of Kansas. I have a very basic question about terminology. Um, when we use the term health coverage, I think of opportunities for people with disabilities like myself, one in five Americans, to get the health care we need to be contributing citizens to be able to work. When I hear the term health insurance, I think of a system where we are pariahs as heavy users of health care. I think of underwriting against covering us. So I guess I just want to raise the question of when we look at this huge population of people experiencing disabilities or chronic conditions, are we talking about health coverage? Or are we talking about health insurance and profit-making companies? Well, I think the Affordable Care Act is, is trying to, to move that paradigm because of course, as we know, under the Affordable Care Act, pre-existing condition restrictions could not be held against people and the presumption is to move toward universal coverage. But John, maybe you want to say I, I, I some just, more. And I'd just add one other thing. Yeah, a lot of it is health insurance and I would argue that you can also find in there health coverage. Like for example, coverage of preventive services without any cost sharing up front. But even more importantly, and this is, this is a tough one, but Title VIII of the law is referred to as CLASS, Community Living Assistance Services and Supports. Not perfect by any means and yet, if we can figure out how to put it on a sound footing to actually implement it in 2013, it is a, the beginning of a potential revolution in disability policy in the United States and the most significant advance forward since we created Medicaid in 1965 because people don't have to impoverish themselves to be able to sustain themselves. Now, that has a lot of problems because there were flaws in how it was written and in the political environment in Congress, there's no space to be able to go in and say, let's have an honest conversation about how we can fix this to make it work and do it. It's sort of either implement it or repeal it. And 
that is where we ought to be able to find some common ground. And it seemed like we did in this process. I mean, we got unanimous support in the Senate Health Committee, bipartisan, for the class as it was reported out. And then everything went haywire in August 2009. But so I would say that it is there, and it requires people knowing it and moving forward and, and trying to say, listen, let's just, let's not throw it out. Let's fix it. It needs fixing. But let's not lose sight that we are doing such an awful job in the United States in terms of the nation's disability policy. And particularly supporting people to stay in their own homes as opposed to move into institutions, mm -hmm. yes. uh, which is the fundamental uh, yeah. premise of the class. Let me just say, the, 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 but one of the real, again, deficits of the ACA, unfortunately, I think, is the notion of mandating, again, insurance that people have to buy private health insurance rather than talking about covering the population uh, with something like uh, improved Medicare for all. Okay. Question here in the front. Well, then that's a great segue. Good morning. My name is Ken Bentz from Minnesota. This is directed more at Julie about the issue of personal responsibility. And what I see as the logical flaw of that is that the consequences of a choice that I might make are not only restricted to affecting me. For example, if I choose not to play and cover myself or my family, if I get hurt or injured, the effects of not having coverage don't only impact me. The medical community, by legislation and by conscience, cannot refuse to treat me if I'm not covered by my own choice. So I think that's somewhat of a red herring, that argument. I'd like to know what your thoughts are. Actually, when I was talking about personal responsibility, I'm talking about the implications of our individual choices on our health more than anything. And I think so many times we acquiesce to care providers, insurance companies, et cetera, when we know as public health professionals that the majority of what the impact is on our health is our choices that we make every day. Do we chew? What are we eating? Well, you know, are we reading the labels and identifying what we're going to buy in a restaurant? Are we smoking? Are we wearing helmets when we're bike riding? Are we wearing seatbelts when we're driving? Those are personal responsibility issues that I'm passionate about because until we change our behavior, population health will never change. Population health is the compilation of all of our health individually. So if we care about population health, I believe we should care passionately about personal responsibility. And okay. Let me just say the. Today's Chicago Times, however, uh, points out the food deserts in Chicago. It's absolutely remarkable. For about 400,000 residents of Chicago live in food deserts where, in fact, they can't uh, buy fresh fruits and uh, vegetables and things like that easily because, in fact, they're not offered in their communities, which gets to, again, a community approach. Exactly. To I'm, I'm to with you. With you know, I'm fully aware of those and, things. And, and, and the and, obligation and to shape an environment right. in which people right. can make, make the correct choices. Exactly. So, okay. In the back, please. Um, my name is Grace Pertner from Missouri. Uh, in, oh. Hi. <laughs> um, in 1991, I finished a dissertation called Medicaid Policy and Infant Survivability. I found great disparities by the maternal residents at the time of birth. And it so happens that the states with the worst survival records for infants are those with the greatest minority populations. And I think the one reason we should support the Affordable Care Act is the health disparities. We need to eliminate those. For 20 years, <laughs> I've been presenting reports that are uh, from that study. And often the professionals will say, oh, sounds like you want universal something or another. And I've been saying, government doesn't need to do it. But somebody needs to do it. And in 20 years, I've not seen that somebody do it. So government needs to do it. What can we do to just get people to support this law, enact it, then change it if it isn't working? So um, uh, we actually, when I was at Hunter College, we did, we did a conference last, uh, last December on health inequities and the Affordable Care Act. And Brian Smedley, who I think is going to be in the next pan set of panel discussions, if he's in here or somewhere. Um, it's just done some fantastic work that I urge you to take a look at and, and at the Joint Center. Uh, over 75 provisions of the Affordable Care Act address either directly or indirectly 
uh, health inequities and trying to reduce or eliminate health disparities. It is, it is a landmark. It is a landmark for many reasons, but is very much a landmark for that. And, and again, in the repeal and replace conversation, I have never heard any indication of wanting, uh, on the part of folks who want to repeal the law, of preserving and moving forward and creating a better framework um, on this issue. And I think it's incumbent upon this community to push and demand answers for what would you do instead and not just take a pass and say, oh, they don't care about that. Okay. All right. We are really at the end of our time, so let's take these last two questions very quickly and we'll wrap up. Uh, Steve Potsick from uh, Chicago. Uh, I actually had one, one question, but now I have uh, two questions. The first one is... No, um, one. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Uh, uh, the first one is very brief. Uh, there was a suggestion that um, could there be a common ground of presenting maybe 10 facts that the United States population would understand about the health care system in the United States? Okay, we, 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 we dealt with that Yeah, earlier, I understand so. that, but we didn't get any consensus. So I guess what I'm kind of pushing the envelope well, take a little. take it from Sisyphus. That's a long haul. But go on. Could, let's move. To, seriously, okay. in the interest of time, let's move to your next question. Okay. The next, the next question is um, a, a part of what I see a lot, and uh, in, in, I'm a practicing physician as well, and some of the things that I see a lot is the portability issue. And we keep hearing about how we have to develop local co uh, co uh, coalitions. I've done that for about 40 years. But I see people have a great deal of mobility in the United States. And we talk about states having their own systems in that. And yet I see young people saying, you know, I can't even navigate when my company changes the insurance a company that they're using. I can't even negotiate the plans. How can we possibly expect people to negotiate when they move from state to state? Right. I mean, well, that, that we gets us into a really interesting issue about insurance and the Affordable Care Act, which is really not today's topic. But, John, why don't you give us a, a so, one sentence about that? <laughs> I did, I did a, it's a, be a run on sentence. Yes. I, I, I did, I did a presentation before a group of state legislators and I took them to the website of the Massachusetts Connector and walked them through the process of buying insurance and we did it together in seven and a half minutes. And I said, it's about the same amount of time as it takes you to fill up your car with a tank of gas. And I remember when it was illegal for me in most states to pump my own car with gas. And the power of the exchange is the power to let consumers pump their own insurance gas. Simply, easily, effectively empower consumers, not the insurance industry. And that's what it does. And that's my longest run-on sentence ever. And, and, and an excellent, if ungrammatical, response. <laughs> Last question. Hey, good morning. Thanks so much for an important conversation. I'm Kitty Shide, and I'm with United Way Worldwide. Um, I have a question about where the, there does seem to be common ground in agreeing that both public health prevention and health care are important. Yet, no matter what financing mechanism we come up with, unless we do deal with the environmental conditions that cause chronic disease, it's an unsustainable trajectory. Um, have we thought about integrating the two, perhaps looking at ways in which we use every touch point, like Rebecca Oni did with Health Leads in Massachusetts, uh, which I know Dr. McDonald knows about, in using every opportunity in the clinical setting as well as other community settings, including schools, to integrate the diversity of needs for people in terms of health coverage, health care, food needs, um, social needs, et cetera. So love to hear from you about that. Julie? Oliver? Yeah, definitely. I'm a supporter of that. That's why I talk about the system changes and creating a systemic approach at the very local level. Everybody needs to be a part of that solution. So I've worked with the United Way quite a while and very much a supporter of that. Now, let me say that I think that, again, is one of the real problems of private health insurance in this country, that there are silos uh, based usually on employment that don't allow for the integration with community activities with schools, uh, you know, with, uh, you know, creating playgrounds and things of that sort. 
So uh, I do think we have to move away from that paradigm of having uh, you know, individual private health insurance companies uh, whose interest, frankly, is usually to serve the uh, investors uh, who are there to make a profit. And just very briefly, um, the, the Obama administration is with you and the architects of the Affordable Care Act are with you, and you can see it if you read, and if you haven't done it, please read the National Prevention Strategy, which is the first serious attempt on the federal government's part to create an integrated prevention strategy. It's real, but it only becomes real to the extent that we all grab it, run with it, and work constructively, collaboratively together to try to make it real, but it's there. Susan, can okay. I make one more comment? I would just really encourage everybody who cares passionately about health, public health, all of it, to try to, in your own world, be more of a um, convener. You know, I'm, I'm fairly alone in a lot of things that I do in some of the conservative organizations as a proponent of public health and health, et cetera. And I feel very passionately about making sure I teach them about the importance of these things. And I think that's what everybody needs to do. If we continue to have two sides in these arguments, we will never get anywhere. We need more of you to be engaged with conservatives, with Republicans, to help educate them rather than it being a, a, us against you. Okay, well, John opened uh, today by talking about Moses as the first lobbyist going up and coming down with the, uh, <laughs> with the uh, tablets, I think. If we got some common ground coming back down on, on the tablets of today, they would have said that what these folks all agree on is that, first of all, there has to be more awareness about the facts of the health of the American public. There has to be a much deeper understanding of the health crises that we face and what we understand to be the underpinnings of, those crisis, the, of that crisis. Secondly, there has to be a greater understanding of the role of the public health system and the need to beef up the public health system and preserve it in the face of all the pressures that are trying now to tear it apart. And the role of public health in, in shaping health and shaping the environment in which people can make the healthiest possible choices. Clear agreement on that. And finally, also agreement that there are some very good components of the Affordable Care Act that however we keep them in place, whether it's repeal and replace with the same thing or just don't repeal in the first place, these are very important provisions that actually will put dollars in the hands of communities to make a difference in these areas we've been talking about. So I would say not bad for an hour and a half's work on the part of three terrific people Join me in thanking them for this conversation. Thanks. And I believe we now adjourn for a coffee break and see you back at 10.30 for the next session.